Hey, folks, and welcome to another edition of Dog Walk Talk presented to you by Dogs HQ. As always, I'm your host, Jake Roos. And with me, as always, the man, the myth, the legend, the beat writer at Dogs HQ. That's Palmer Toms. PT, what's good, brother? Happy holidays, everyone. Just ready to uh, hit the road here. I'm, I'm home in Nashville, but headed out to Miami later this afternoon. So by the time that y'all hear this, Hopefully I'm in South Beach and uh, ready to roll for uh, Orange Bowl week. Yeah, hard to believe it's here, man. I mean, Christmas kind of came and went and uh, feels like a minute since we did a dog walk talk, too. I guess it has been a little bit, actually, um, given the layoff between sign and day and this. But uh, like you said, Orange Bowl right around the corner, December 31st. What time's kickoff? 730? 730 ESPN. I'm really not confident that'll happen at 7.30, to be honest with you. I think we'll probably get closer to 8, and uh, it won't surprise me if we're watching this game till right up until that ball drops. So it uh, should be an interesting time, no question about it. I know Georgia fans and Michigan fans both looking forward to this. Um, I, I, it's funny because um, I get a lot of emails about uh, – or I get an email every time somebody comments on a video on our YouTube channel – and man, there have been a lot of Michigan fans checking out Dog Walk Talk uh, the last couple of weeks. So, well, hey, we appreciate uh, it. We appreciate yeah, it. Hey, yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. A views of you, right? So, uh, thanks for clicking on Dog Walk Talk. If you're a Michigan fan, hey, welcome. Uh, thanks for being here. And if you're a Dogs fan, um, yeah, a lot to talk about for sure. Uh, I guess, Palmer, let's dive right in on some of the news that we may have missed before we kind of turn the page into uh, Georgia travel. Um, you know, I guess the big thing that happened post signing day um, was, gosh, when was that? Uh, Wednesday, I guess, Thursday, maybe. Um, the news comes out uh, that JT Daniels is uh, uh, affected by COVID, uh, test positive for COVID, um, and uh, kind of throws everything into a frenzy. Uh, for everybody you worry about, I think, um, you know, the, the spread, obviously JT's health uh, first and foremost, but spread amongst the team. Uh, then you've got college football playoff coming out with guidelines of how they're going to handle possible forfeits. If you can't field a team, uh, it, it kind of got crazy there for, for a little bit. Uh, there was a day or two. There is there no, where, th- there is no kind of there. It, it did get crazy. It did. You know, it really did. From, from the, from the college football, you know, playoff perspective, you're looking around at all these bowl games that are being canceled. Um, um, you know, from the you know perspective of media having to change plans. I you know yeah. I was originally supposed to travel yesterday. Now I'm traveling today. Uh, you know, with, had, at some point in there, there was a plan to travel later this week. And you know, there's uh, it's some people that aren't traveling at all. So um, yeah, it it certainly has gotten crazy. Well, and uh, you know, at, listen, I know everybody's tired of talking about COVID and, and all that. Uh, I think we are as well. But the reality is, it's uh, it was a major, major situation for Georgia there for a moment. And depending on how you slice this upcoming game, I think we'll get into the preview later this week. Uh, so make sure to tune back in for that. But depending on how you consider this game, I mean, I think that it's um, it can have a pretty far-reaching effect on that as well. I mean, when you're talking about JT Daniels. Uh, and, you know, Georgia fans wanting him to be out there and wanting him to have that opportunity and, and have the, the chance to kind of get out there and go. Um, in my mind, this kind of eliminates that possibility to a great degree just because, uh, you know, based on, I guess, when he tested positive, uh, should probably knock him out for most of bowl prep. Um, if not all of bowl prep. And so that sets up a situation where your healthy quarterback is Stetson Bennett. He's getting all the reps and um, you know, you got Carson Beck and Brock Vandegrift behind him. Certainly JT will get some work when and if he's able to get back prior to the bowl game. But I guess Palmer, um, you know, your thoughts on just how that affects everything, how that kind of shapes this moving forward. Um, you know, looking at Georgia's chances uh, of, I, I get, like I said, I guess switching up the quarterback spot to me feels out the window. Um, but uh, how, how does that kind of shape everything moving on, I guess? Yeah, I think, you know, it, we would be silly to assume that the COVID situation was isolated to just one player with the way that this virus spreads. um, You know, it's probably safe to assume that it has spread to other team members, other staff members, um, you know, aside from JT Daniels, obviously there was a report that George Pickens had tested positive. 
um, you know, that that has been since followed up with reports that it was a false positive. Um, I think we're going to learn a lot more about Georgia's COVID situation here within the next couple of hours. Um, after you're listening to this, um, you know, hopefully on Monday, uh, we are supposed to see practice down in Miami. Um, and, and so I think that, which comes as a l- little bit of a surprise to me um, with, with the restrictions that college football playoff is putting on uh, media availabilities with the option for teams to travel on the 29th, uh, you know, two days before the game rather than the uh, normal five days before the game, which would put them traveling on the 26th. Um, You know, I I think that it certainly comes as a little bit of a surprise to me that we are seeing practice. Um, You know, I think that that's probably not what Kirby would want, Um, but Kirby doesn't have much of a say in terms of bowl uh, bowl game operations and the way that media is handled there. So um, it'll be interesting to see exactly what that practice looks like. I remember going to the Sugar Bowl practice a couple years ago when it seemed like a lot of players were opting out and Kirby kind of threw us for a you know loop there. And, and you know, it was a, uh, you know, more like circuit style practice. They weren't practicing in their normal position groups. Um, and it was probably just the 10 to 15 minutes that we were seeing um, as opposed to the entirety of the practice. Um, but I think that, you know, we, we could be looking at something interesting like that uh, this week when we see practice. But we will certainly be trying to do our best to get a head count in terms of who is there, who is not there. Um, like you said, with the Daniels, with the timetable of when Daniels tested positive, it would be a surprise if he was there to me. Um, it certainly would be news, and you all would be hearing about that pretty soon after us leaving the practice field. Sure. Um, that would be news to me. Um, George Pickens being there would also be news. It would confirm the false positive narrative. Um, you know, that's something to watch. And, and like I said, we'd be naive to say that this is probably just affecting those two guys. Uh, there's probably others that we're going to learn that aren't going to be there as well. So whether that was, you know, through a, a positive test or, you know, a false positive or whatnot. Um, you know, it's going to be very interesting to see how this affects Georgia in its preparation and, and not really just Georgia. I think that this is, you know, like I said earlier, across the entire landscape of college football, you're seeing this, this virus come back and, and, you know, affect these bowl games. Um, it, it, you know, we haven't heard a ton about of it about it out of these other programs. Uh, you know, Alabama has had two coordinators, two coaches, an offensive coordinator and an offensive line coach, uh, Bill O'Brien and Doug Marone, respectively there. Uh, test positive. They did not travel with the team. Nick Saban said that it hasn't spread to the players, um, but I think that that's something that we'll probably learn more about as they get into their practices. Uh, and we haven't heard much of it out of the Cincinnati and Michigan camps. Um, but, you know, again, with the way that this virus is is working across the entire country, it would come as a surprise to me if it hasn't affected those teams at all. So, um, you know, I know y'all tune in here for football talk, but you know, the, the virus and, and it's certainly having an effect on football. Um, and we're going to see, you know, learn a lot more about how much it has affected things throughout this week. Um, so I think, you know, if you're talking about things that you want to learn this week from Georgia, um, you know, pretty quickly, we'll, we'll get a good idea of who's healthy and who's not. Sure. No, no question about it. I mean, um, it's, it is what it is. And I I think that, you know, really, like you said, you know, we don't want to make this a show about, uh, you know, everything going on with, with the virus, but, uh, respectively, it it probably has shaped this game and, and, and it certainly shapes the lead up to it, uh, in a pretty major way. Um, especially if, if JT, uh, you know, is positive and, and not there and, um, that would be huge news. I mean, that yeah, was, you, I mean, you certainly put quarterback stories on hold if if that's if that's sure. the case. Like you said, you're probably looking at a situation where Stetson Bennett is your starting quarterback, which has been the case for most of the season. So it's not, you know, a huge shock, a huge shakeup. Uh, but you know, for the narrative that it could potentially change, you're you're probably not seeing a potential change. Yeah, no, absolutely. And really, it, it may open the idea of, well, then, OK, who's the backup? So is it Carson Beck? Is it Brock Vandegrift? Is JT able to return and serve in some role? And it, it's just a lot of unknown at this point. And look, you can ask Kirby the question, who's going to be the backup now? And he's going to say, oh, there's no problem. He's probably, if I were guessing, 
let me paint the picture here. It's going to be something that along the lines of uh, there is no, there is no permanent starter name. Everybody's competing for this job, doing a great job. We feel confident in all of these options. Uh, JT uh, working through some things, be back with us soon. We feel like he can help if he needs to, you know, I, it's going to be standard Kirby speak. So I'm not too uh, optimistic that we're going to find out much. Although I, like I said, my best educated guess is of when the Capital One Orange Bowl uh, begins, that it will be, um, it will be Stetson Bennett under center. I, I can't see a situation where that's not the case. Um, but I guess moving away from that, that was the big uh, news piece, I guess, since signing day. With the lead up to this, um, you know, I think that's going to be the situation everybody's going to talk about because quite frankly, that's been what everybody's talked about all season is the quarterback situation for Georgia. It's been the overriding narrative regardless realistically of, you know, if the team was performing well, or if they floundered against Alabama, it kind of all circles back to that for most people. Um, but I guess leading up to this game, Palmer, you know, uh, over the course of these, these next couple of days in talking to players in hearing from, Whoever the Georgia defensive coordinator is that they put on the stage um, will be interesting as well. Uh, you, you've got staff members. You've got an opportunity to speak to the players. You've got uh, Kirby's going to have some media availability. You're going to be able to see practice. What are the big things in the lead up to this game that I guess can impact this game and kind of shape this uh, moving forward? Yeah, I mean, like you said, I think that there is – you know, several things that you want to learn, um, you know, first and foremost, it would be the health of this team. Um, and that's what we will learn through seeing practice. Um, you know, we, we get 15 minutes on Monday, 15 minutes on Tuesday, um, assuming all, you know, plans still hold. And, and that's a big assumption in this world. Um, but I, I think that, you know, from those situations, you can learn a lot about the health of this team. I think that, uh, like you said, the, the coordinator um, situation on, on defense is certainly something to watch and monitor, um, you know, with, with us speaking to the defensive coordinator first thing Monday morning. Uh, I think we'll get an answer to that pretty quickly, whether it's Dan Lanning that comes out there, um, whether it's Glenn Schumann or whether it's Will Muschamp. I think that, you know, anytime you've asked Kirby about this and, and anytime that you've asked a player about it, too. Um, they feel confident in all three of those guys that it's it's you know you, you essentially have four defensive coordinators um, or four defensive coordinator caliber coaches in in that you know defensive you know room in that defensive meeting room um, with Kirby Smart you know being the head coach with a defensive coordinating background uh, you know Will Muschamp being a, you know a, a, the special teams coordinator and, and working with the DBs but also having a head coaching and defensive coordinating background. Uh, to his career as well. Dan Lanning being the actual defensive coordinator, but now he's got a head coaching, you know, gig uh, and, and whether, you know, how that plays out, we'll see. And then, you know, the, the co-defensive coordinator, uh, Glenn Schumann there. So you've really got four guys that I feel like could run the defense if asked to, um, you know, four guys that, that Georgia would feel comfortable doing that. Um, and, and so I think that, you know, Regardless of who they send out, um, whether it's Lanning or Schumann or Muschamp, um, you are going to see all four of those guys involved in the decision making for the defense. So I think that that's something that that'll be you know worth monitoring. Um, but I think that it is going to be something that that you know, like I said, it's 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 going to be a story. It's going to be worth monitoring, but it's not going to be a deciding factor, in my opinion. Um, I think that all four of those guys are going to be involved. Um, and, you know, even if one of them isn't involved, which would probably be landing in this scenario, uh, they've got three other guys that are, you know, fully capable of stepping up into that role. Um, so I think that that's going to be interesting. I think it's going to be interesting to hear from some of these players um, about, you know, like, like we said, you know, after the Alabama game, like they have said countless times after that Alabama game, um, they're, they're they want to put that loss behind them rather than letting it linger, and they want to learn lessons from it. And so, I, you know, as much as they can talk the talk this week, we want to see them walk the walk, uh, and and show, you know the media show their coaches show fans uh, you know, what lessons they've learned. You, you know, you can't let the same mistakes beat you against Michigan as they did against Alabama. And so, you know, 
we'll hear them talk about it this week. Um, but I, I, again, I don't know how much you're going to learn from hearing them talk as much as you will learn from watching them play on Friday. Um, and, and then offensively, like you said, um, I think the quarterback situation is certainly something worth monitoring. Um, you know, with, with the JT Daniels uh, COVID test, it's probably – Less likely that we would see a change there, but it's certainly, you know, like I said, worth monitoring. Um, but I also think that, you know, just the offense as a whole has a big challenge ahead of it, uh, you know, with with pass rushers like Aiden Hutchinson, uh, you know, guys, guys that are fully capable of, you know, very much so impacting a game. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see how Georgia kind of handles that. Um, they'll need to handle it a lot better than, than they did against Alabama in order to come away with a win. Yeah, I think that's pretty, pretty, pretty fair to say that. Uh, that that seems like a reasonable take. Uh, um, I would agree. Um, you know, for me, I, I think the big story this week is uh, George Pickens. Personally, I mean, I, I feel confident in in you know the people that we've spoken to, the reports that are out there about JT Daniels testing positive. Right, I, I think that that's the case. You know, I assume that he that will limit his availability, whatever availability that may be, if available at all. But with Pickens, to me, you've got a guy who, you know, took steps back over the course of Georgia's last two games, made a really big catch in that Alabama game, um, was effective. But if if you don't have him involved, that kind of shapes this game pretty in, in, in a much different way. He's just that's just one less thing Michigan has to worry about. And um, so I, I'm really intrigued to see how that goes this week. You know, like you said, this idea of, you know, moving past that Alabama game and focusing on on Michigan. You know, I've had a lot of people ask me that question. You know, do you have any concerns about Georgia looking ahead to Alabama? And I don't really in this situation. I mean, you know, was there some of that? Was there that to a degree in the SEC championship? Perhaps I can see that have, having been the case uh, that they were thinking ahead to to the next step. But at the same time, you know, this is a winner. This is a winner go home scenario, and so you can't think much further than than Friday um, in uh, for this one. Um, you know, another one I've gotten, and and I, I personally don't see this as a big concern, but I guess it's something that's lingering out there, is does the departure of Dan Lanning affect this game at all? You know, is that a distraction? You know, does – I guess between, you know, you've got, you've got the COVID situation, you got Dan Lanning, you've got Alabama's lingering ahead of you if you – you know, I mean, presumably Alabama is going to be who you face. That's what you think is going to happen. You know – is Georgia kind of up against it, I guess, when it comes to these distractions or is this, I, I don't know, to me, obviously the time of year kind of pushes the importance of these things and makes them a, a little bit more magnified, but is this something that, that can, that's going to get to them? I, I don't know. I don't know how I feel about that necessarily because going into Alabama, I wouldn't have said that there was much that would have rattled them then, but obviously that's not how that turned out. And so uh, could they be in for a similar situation here? I think that they could be, um, but like you said, I think that the time of year, there's there's certainly those distractions out there, things that are capable of doing that. But like you said, I think the time of year makes the makes it so that you have to be locked in, and and I think that these teams, all four of these teams, have plenty of distractions out there. Whether it's the the narrative of Cincinnati being the group of five team to burst the bubble and, and try and be Cinderella of the group, Alabama dealing with COVID, but also defending its national championship being, you know, a quote unquote down Alabama team. I think that they want to prove that wrong. They've got injuries that have been, you know, I, I could be a distraction there. Um, you know, with, with Michigan, I think that you've got to be wondering, you know, the big hurdle that they've tried to get over for years and years and years under Jim Harbaugh has been at Ohio State. Okay, great. They did that. Well, do they, you know, is there a sense of complacency there? Or is it, you know, hey, we've got bigger goals out there. Um, I think that all these teams, and, and obviously Georgia's distractions are, are very well known to this audience. I think that with all these teams, there is that, that potential for distraction. Not to mention the fact that all these teams have guys that are probably going to be picked in the first round of the NFL draft in, sure. in you know, a matter of months. So, you know, these college careers are winding down. These NFL decisions are looming. Um, 
I think that there's there's distractions out there for every player, uh, every team, but it's just a matter of how you handle those. Um, and, and I think that with this being with the time of year that it is, you know, it, it's win or go home. And, and all these players understand that. Um, I think that that, you know, with, with with how many distractions are out there that could affect it. I think that these players won't let it affect it, um, affect their play, affect the way that this team comes out and, and performs. And, and you know, I, I said it in my preview for the Michigan group, um, and I'll say it here. I have a hard time seeing Georgia losing two in a row, and I think that's because uh, because of that that leadership group, that that focus that they've had all year long. They seem to slip a little bit against Alabama, but I have a really hard time seeing them, you know, slip once again here in, in, in a second straight game in a game of this magnitude. I have a hard time seeing them slip. Yeah, I can see that. I understand that. I, I guess, though, you know, in thinking about it, George is the only one of this group of four that's coming in with a bad taste in their mouth. They're the only ones coming off of negativity, right? And so uh, everybody else won their conference championship, uh, you know, everything. I mean, they've won their last game. So, you know, from a momentum standpoint, George is kind of playing from behind in, in that respect. Um, I mean, I agree with you. I think that there is, you know, certainly uh, – I've kind of likened it to Alabama, not to say that Georgia is playing similar to Alabama, but I think the situation is similar in that, you know, Georgia's in the winner go die, you know, the winner go home and die situation. I mean, it's what, it's what Alabama was up against. Alabama came into that game knowing that they came in with a chip on their shoulder and Georgia, you know, uh, man, I mean, like you said, it's hard to imagine them losing two in a row, but if they did do that, it washes away all the goodwill that you worked up over the course of the season and all that historic defense talk and all that, you know, uh, as great as it was, it, it's all for naught. Cause if you finish yeah. on those, on those two notes, it's all out the window. Well, and, uh, and another thing that I think that you want to think about here is, you know, with these, with Georgia and with Alabama, they were expected to be here. So, you know, coming into the season, at least, you know, and throughout the season, there was that expectation that Georgia and Alabama would be here. And so they're not going to, to me, I don't think that you're going to see any sense of complacency from those two teams. But if you look at Alabama, if, excuse me, if you look at Michigan and you look at Cincinnati, I mean, they had less than half, you know, a percent chance to make the playoffs coming yeah. into the year. Um, you know, Cincinnati probably had a little bit higher of a chance based on their schedule, but Michigan came into this year unranked. And so, you know, I still think that, you know, I, I don't think that you're going to see these teams just be like, hey, look, we made it. Congratulations. Let's pack sure, it up. Let's go home. It doesn't matter. You go out and play these games for a reason. But I think that at the same time, there's there's still meat left on that bone for Georgia and for Alabama and, you know, it, it, like you said, it's a, it's a, it's a win or go home, you know, win or die situation here. Um, well, Georgia's, and Georgia, Georgia to me right now is the team, the, the team probably of the four that has the most to prove because, yep. because Michigan, like you said, unranked, right? If, if it's probably, obviously they're not going to be satisfied to just get into the playoff, but that's an accomplishment in and of itself. I mean, and it's something that they haven't done under this system. Obviously Cincinnati has done a tremendous job and, and, and kind of burst that bubble, like you said, for, for the, uh, out of the group of five. Okay. And then Alabama bounces back with all of the negativity surrounding them. So Georgia's is the big, the one with something to prove. I mean, Georgia's is the one people are, people, the, the narrative is, you know, Georgia may be the fraudulent team this year. Uh, you know, they 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 kind of skated by on a schedule. They skated by, um, you know, with the defense. The offense was never tested. And to some degree, I think some of those criticisms are fair. I mean, I think that Alabama kind of exposed a little bit of that. But at the same time, the Bulldogs have probably the most questions to answer. And I think it would be uh, the worst out. I would say they they would be they would be the team most derided for for being eliminated in this portion of the playoff. I think. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that that's that's probably a fair assessment because, I mean, like you said, Michigan has never made the playoff. It's an accomplishment to be here. 
Cincinnati, the group of five has never made the playoff. It's an accomplishment for them to be here. Georgia has made the playoff. So it's, 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 it's an accomplishment, but it's not necessarily something that they're going to celebrate at the end of the year, right. you know, and, and, and that they can rest on those laurels. They've made the playoff before. They've made a national championship game before. They haven't yeah. won a national championship game. And so Georgia's trying, you know, while, while Michigan and Cincinnati have already gotten to those new heights, Georgia is still trying to get to those new heights under this format, under Kirby Smart since 1980. Every Georgia fan knows all the stats, and you don't need to hear them again here. But I think that Georgia understands, you know, what – and, and for Alabama – they won the thing last year. They've won it, you know, countless times under Nick Saban. If they if they weren't to win it, it's not the end of the world. But I think for a lot of Georgia fans, this is it, it, I don't know that it was natty or bust throughout the, you know, coming into the year. Um, but I think that throughout the season, that expectation was built up that this team was fully yeah. capable of winning one. And if you look down the road, you know, with the guys that are probably leaving, the guys. I don't know that your expectations are going to be as high next year. And so it's kind of a, Hey, Kirby, you've got the, you've got a perfect situation here. Go do something with it. Sure. Sure. Well, and you saw how long it took Georgia to get back into this position. I mean, exactly. Win- the window is the window. And so it's, you know, how, how long does it take you to kind of revamp? And I, you know, obviously Georgia's like I said, it's like I say all the time, everybody's trying to get to be where Alabama is, where they're a consistent force in this. You expect at some point and to some degree that they're going to probably be involved in this. Um, but for Georgia, that's not been the case this, to this point. Obviously, Michigan has not made it. Uh, Cincinnati has not made it. You know, Alabama is the one, the one consistent factor here. Georgia's been here and has been to the national championship under Kirby Smart. But the window is what the window is. And right now you feel like the window is probably – as open as it's going to get for a minute anyway. Um, I mean, especially considering the fact that Alabama's out here getting Elias Ricks and Jameer Gibbs just, I mean, building this thing like a, like your your buddy died and you're picking up all of his scraps from the, the fantasy portal. I mean, it's they're, they're, they're stacking them up. And um, so I think that, you know, all of that is uh, at play here. Uh, you know, I'm interested to see, you know, kind of the mindset of these players uh, this week. I, I think that that's going to be something that's going to be interesting to talk to when you, when you hear them in these interviews and you get the chance to speak to them, you know, where is their head at? You know, what's, I, I don't, like I said, I don't think they're going to look past this one, but are they excited to be here? Is this what they wanted? Are they, do you get the sense that they've been able to kind of wipe the slate clean from what happened on December 4th? Uh, or are they kind of still, you know, is that there's a little bit of lingering doubt. Obviously, they're never going to say that, but I'm just curious if we'll be able to pick things like that, up like that from their demeanor, from their, uh, you know, approach. Um, you know, will you see an enthusiastic Georgia team? Will you see a focused Georgia team? Or will you see a Georgia team that maybe it has a chip on its shoulder? And I'm not saying a chip on your shoulder is a bad thing to have in this scenario, but it is um, – to me, that would that would sort of indicate that hey, you're still kind of holding on to the past a little bit. Yeah, yeah, and and I think those are all things that we will get a taste for uh, a sense of this week uh, as as we arrive down there as as we get to you know see some of these players both virtually and in person um, and and kind of get a feel for things. I think that that's we'll have you covered on all that throughout the week um, it, online on social media. Um, and then coming back to you later this week with the podcast. But I think that that um, that's absolutely what I want to learn this week. Um, I think that that's kind of been the basis of what this podcast has been about. And, you know, what do we want to learn from Georgia this week? What do we want to see? Uh, what questions need to be answered? I wrote that story earlier today. Um, so go check that out. But I think that as the team arrives in South Florida, the the pressure is amped up you know it, you're no longer in Athens in bowl prep you are in South Florida for a playoff game it's a business trip and I think that there's a lot of questions that Georgia media Georgia fans want to see answered throughout the week and and you know that that's kind of uh you know that's what's going to be important before you you kick things off on on Friday night well speaking of business trips I know you got to get ready for one palm so um Unless you got something else, I think we should hang it up. So uh, 
I think we'll wrap it for this episode of Dog Walk Talk. Make sure to get over to Dogs HQ prior to uh, the Capital One Orange Bowl. We'll have you covered on all things dogs. Uh, like Palmer said, uh, full coverage of practice, um, media availabilities, whatever we can see, we will be there and we will be on top of it. And uh, we'll have it all for you over at Dogs HQ. So make sure to get over and check all of that out. For Palmer Toms and myself, Jake Roos, this has been Dog Walk Talk presented to you by Dogs HQ.